is. <laughs> what an entrance. That's great. Well, All right. Everything. <laughs> I think we'll have some people joining in as we go, but um, welcome back to everyone who's uh, who was on last time and anyone who's new to uh, another riveting round of courtside seats with some excellent panelists who I'm, I'm very grateful that each of you took the time out of your uh, very busy schedules, let's say, to jump on this call. I know that I've seen a few of you definitely Carly on some other other conferences and in, involved in some other coaching clinics as well so I know that each of you are contributing to the growth of, of basketball across Canada um, almost every other night so thank you for taking the time to to uh, join us on ours so um last week I don't think I Ooh. come on guys <laughs> Woo! let's go all, all right we're fired up love it so last week <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I actually formally introduced myself, but for anyone who doesn't know me, who's on, on the line, my name is Tasia McKenna. I'm the technical director and performance coach with Basketball Nova Scotia. I've been there for about five years, four and a half years, something like that. And I've gotten to know kind of each of, of our panelists that have been on, that were on last week, on tonight, and, and on next week over a course of time, whether it was through this position, um, or through coaching clinics or any other element that involves basketball. Um, even had the chance to coach Hannah. That's right, back in the day. Um, so thanks to everyone who joined. Um, a few things just to keep in mind. We can't see you, you can see us, uh, and we can't hear you. Again, I know that seems very silly to say, but I think it's important <laughs> to just make note that you know you can get up and do your thing and, and you won't bother us. Um, couple other things. There is a Q&A. So last week I started off by asking a couple of questions that we had uh, prepared and then we kind of ventured into the Q&A that was coming in from the attendees. So please don't hesitate to put that in the Q&A box, which is down at the bottom of your screen. If it's something that we can get around to, we will, but I think last week we probably missed about five or six questions just based off the length of time. Um, Lastly, or I guess two more things. So 8.30 is kind of our cutoff time. So we originally had it for eight, but last week's conversation went really well. We went until about 8.30. So just giving everyone a bit of a timeline for what to expect there. And then the last thing is um, that there's a lot of other coaching opportunities across the country. So um, I'm gonna put something here to everybody. So we have some different links going on here. Um, that I just want to share with everyone. So I know Basketball New Brunswick has some virtual clinics going on. There's a Cross Canada coaching clinic that Carly, I know you spoke in earlier this week. Uh, you're in the International Coaching Coaches Summit. And then uh, one of the big ones that everyone's doing across the country, which I think is critical, is our safe sport training, um, which can be done entirely for free. And it's something that we want all of our coaches doing because ultimately our job as coaches to, is to take care of our athletes and uh, make sure that we have the knowledge and, and information in case we uh, think that there's anything that we need to do to protect our athletes. So um, again, that's something that you can do for free. It's in something called the locker, um, but you can take a look at that if anyone has the time or wants to get some more education around just safe sport training. So um, with all that being said, we'll move right on to our wonderful panelists, I'm gonna start with uh, Carly Clark. I'm gonna to try to go in alphabetical order because that's what I've really been trying to do. Um, so Carly is from Nova Scotia and she is the head coach of Ryerson women's basketball team and is the assistant coach with our senior women's basketball team um, for Canada basketball, which is awesome. I have a very specific question for you when it comes down to the Olympics. So I'm excited to hear some information on that from you. Um, in alphabetical order, we got who? Hannah Brown. Yeah, I'm pretty good at that. Perfect. Yeah. Hannah. Let's do it. <laughs> professional athlete um, playing over in Germany. I want to pronounce it properly. TK Hanover. Please correct me if I'm wrong. I'm good with that. Awesome. So professional basketball player uh, is from Nova Scotia, played for our provincial programs and, and had a great five-year uh, go with the Cape Breton Capers. So excited to have you on, Hannah. Thank you for taking the time to, to join us. Um, Lou Walsh, 
having a nice drink there, preparing to, to chat away. Um, Senior Director of Basketball Development of, so of sorts. I feel like I've read your title several different times um, with Basketball Ontario, but I know you do a lot of things within that title, um, everything from officiating to advancing women in coaching positions. So i um, excited to have you on board. And Maddie Belding, welcome all the way from Windsor. So she is the assistant coach or one of the assistant coaches with the uh, University of Windsor women's basketball program. So we got a lot of different people with a lot of different perspectives on the call today and, and I'm excited to have you here. So I gave a re oh, and Maddie's from New Brunswick. I gotta give credit there. Sorry about that. Yeah. Uh, so I'm gonna pass it off to each of you. So Carly, if you wanna give a bit of your, your history on how you got to where you are today, which I think is a, is a pretty neat journey with your ties to, to your role with PEI and all that good stuff. So we'll start with you. And if you could give everyone a bit of uh, your history, that'd be great. Uh, sure. Well, I grew up in Halifax. So uh, Nova Scotia has been my home and is still my home, even though I live in Toronto now. Um, so I grew up in Halifax, played high school basketball for QEH. Had to throw that in there because uh, we had a great team uh, during my era. And uh, I don't know, the young ends maybe don't even know what QEH is anymore, but uh, there were some pretty good players and, and programs that went through there. And we usually beat CEC, so um, that's <laughs> because Lou and I are from a similar era. I don't remember those wins and losses. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, so I grew up in Halifax. Um, you know, I think something unique that I, that I think it's important to share, when I was growing up, um, a lot of the local universities were all coached by women. So Dr. Carolyn Savoy, Jill Jeffrey, uh, Angie McLeod was a prominent uh, women's coach at the time, Laura Saunders. So, um, you know, it was just the norm for me to be surrounded by women coaching at the university level. Um, so I had a lot of exposure to St. Mary's and Dow in particular and um, loved the game from an early age went on to play at Bishop's University and then started coaching in, in provincial team programs with basketball Nova Scotia um, throughout the summers towards the end of that, um, my end of my playing career at Bishop's. So um, got into coaching right away, um, was coached by some great coaches that certainly encouraged that pathway. And uh, from there, just tried to take advantage of every opportunity, talk to, watch, learn from every, every coach I had a chance to connect with. And, uh, began coaching in some center for performance, continued with provincial team, went through a national team program for a year and, and was hired uh, by the University of Prince Edward Island um, when I was 26. So i um, really grateful for that opportunity to, to start head coaching at a really young age, spent three years there at UPEI, started coaching um, the age group national teams and uh, after three years at UPEI, I moved on, on to Ryerson University here in Toronto. Not too shabby. Not too shabby at all. Um, I know you did some um, announcing that the U Sport final, final eight there, and I, I thought that was pretty neat to hear your perspective when it came to, you know, reflecting on your time at, at UPEI. So thank you for doing that for, for all of us that were tuned in. Uh, Hannah, send it right over to you. Thanks, Tasia. It's honestly, it's an honor to be uh, asked to join in on this conversation to hear all your stories. I'm really excited and looking forward to it. Um, I started playing basketball at the age of eight, uh, born and raised North Sydney, Nova Scotia, small little island, Cape Breton Island. Um, developed on the north side, eventually got to the point where uh, I was given the opportunity to play for my province. As you mentioned before, Tasia's my coach, whoop whoop. Uh, <laughs> so from you, yeah, U14, U17, uh, got to represent my province after that. Uh, that kind of gave me opportunities to uh, continue on with my basketball career and uh, play university basketball at Cape Breton University. And after five great years, I didn't want to throw in the towel just yet. Uh, so I decided to play overseas. I started my first season in Germany. And yeah, hopefully uh, look forward to continuing on with my basketball career and being involved in the basketball community forever. I don't think I can let it go. <laughs> Absolutely. 
All right, Lou, what you got? Uh, okay, let me let me read. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, I uh, I grew up in Truro, Nova Scotia. They call it the hub. Yeah, they sure <laughs> Everyone do. Stop there on their way to Halifax to use the washroom. <laughs> Going from New Brunswick to Halifax. Um, yeah, grew up in Truro. Uh, was born into a family where my dad was referee and had three older siblings who played basketball, really had no choice. Uh, I did play soccer, but no one came to watch me, so I continued on down the basketball pathway. Um, played on the Nova Scotia provincial teams at that time. I think it was U15, U17, U19. Mm. I think that no longer exists at the U19 level. Came up yeah, we had some awesome epic battles against QEH. Um, I don't remember the wins and losses, but I do remember the change room in the basement. That was <laughs> that was something you'll never forget. Um, went on to play at the University of Alberta uh, for two years. Uh, I'll get I, for two years because in the failures question, uh, I'll talk about the failure out of school and then the transfer back east. To the University of New Brunswick in Fredericton where I finished out my final three. Um, found myself down in Windsor. I thought I was moving to Windsor, Nova Scotia, but it was Windsor, Ontario. <laughs> Living across oh, from yeah. Detroit, what? <laughs> um, and again, sort of, you know, stumbling my way around not understanding what life was not being an athlete anymore i just finished my bachelor of education was practice teaching down there i tried to get on Chantel's staff um i ended up coaching a novice u9 team um like we were at the university level uh, and i joined the old boys club with the officiating so i Moved away from the, well, you know, you age out. I didn't have the opportunity. I wasn't as good as Hannah to go play pro. Uh, so I, I went the officiating and coaching route and, and did my master's in human kinetics, sports psychology, and sort of fell into this job at Ontario Basketball uh, and have been there for eight years now. And yes, Hannah, you're right. As much as you try to get out of it, you, you, there's you nothing. Know. You can't let it go. Matches it. I know. Nothing beats it. <laughs> <laughs> all right maddie last but not least all right um well, i'm from new brunswick sussex new brunswick uh i guess the dairy capital of atlanta canada among other slogans that they try and sell um i i think i like to think i'm an honorary cape retiner because i spent every summer there my entire life uh, my mom's <laughs> yeah exactly my mom's a cape retiner my dad went to he was a caper and when it was still uccb he played mm -hmm. there so um, I spent every every summer pretty much, you know, trying to talk to Fabian, you know, playing basketball, trying to be with the boys, that kind of stuff, you know, trying to beat them, trying to beat my brothers. But uh, yeah, and then uh, so I played all the way through and then I went to Acadia um, to do my my bachelor's in, uh, in kinesiology and my body really did not agree with my dream of playing at the next level. So I had a nice blown ACL and then a couple shoulder issues and after a year I was I was in so much pain all the time. I just thought there's got to be something more. Like I can't always be in pain all the time. And then I took a year to kind of just think about it. And I realized I couldn't step away from basketball. So I just kind of fell into a position with Basketball New Brunswick. I just asked a former coach of mine if she needed some help. And she said, what are you doing next weekend? So I, I just stepped in, helped out. The next year they gave me a head coaching job, which was an interesting choice at 20 years old. But we did what we did what we could and um then it, it was kind of i i started researching coaching um from like a research perspective in school shout out to professor ann dodge at acadia yeah uh, she yes. she really got me going and uh that's when i really started to take it seriously and then i applied to two schools my application to uft disappeared so the only option was to go to ubc and i did my masters in coaching and coached with deb for two years and then i was fortunate enough to get an opportunity here at the University of Windsor and that's where I've been since 2017 and I couldn't be happier. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, there was a, a quote I wanted to read just before you guys got into this, but um, from my good friend, Michelle Obama, she's not my friend, but I like to pretend that we would be, we would be friends if ever I had a chance to meet her. Um, <laughs> if we can open up a little bit more and share our story, stories, 
that's what breaks down barriers. So I know that I asked each of you to share a bit of how you got to where you are. Um, and I think it's really important when, when we're reflecting on um, what we're doing here, which is to hopefully encourage some more women to get into some coaching and officiating positions. So um, thanks for, for sharing your stories. So we'll get into my, my very first question. Cause I, we have a list of them, as you know, um, I, I'm going to go right into um, when you stopped your playing career. And I, I think it'll be interesting because Hannah, obviously you're, you're still in yours. Um, and Maddie, you just mentioned that yours stopped because you, your body couldn't, uh, couldn't take it anymore. So I'm just wondering, um, it was a similar question that we asked last week in it, but I think there's always different perspectives. Um, kind of what, what advice do you have for those people who are finishing their career, whether it is uh, through an injury or they've graduated um, or they didn't make a team and kind of how can they prepare themselves for what comes after that? And then I think for Hannah, I think with you it would be, are you doing anything right now to prepare yourself for that transition when it happens? Absolutely. Um, I actually prepared for the transition after my university career during it. I never had the intention or never thought that it was available to me to uh, play professionally. Um, so I kind of mentally prepared for it a little bit more. I started running oh. and I just wanted to be part of something competitive because whether we want to believe it or not, like we're always going to be competitive and in sport, I've just grown so much and was able to grow through sport. So I needed to kind of find something that I could grow into and continue to move on with that process, but as well, just to find something to be competitive in whatever you decide to do is a huge piece. So I'm working through it now, but once it's over, I'm definitely going to have to find that thing that I want to be good at again and continue to follow the chain of growing and mm -hmm. developing. Yeah. What else, what else we got around here? I know we're, we're all done. We've all retired. Unless anyone's playing in women's leagues. Why don't I got my hoop on front? <laughs> <laughs> Work on your form shooting. Uh, yeah. So what was that like um, when you stopped playing and what was that transition process like um, in terms of preparing yourself for finding your career and, and living a life that, wasn't as an athlete. I think for me, jumping in here, um, I had no idea what I was going to do when I graduated from university and my eligibility was up. I was starting to think about some options and I happened to get a call from, from Carolyn at Dal, uh, who asked if I wanted to come join her, her coaching staff and be an assistant coach. And I had been coaching a little bit in the summers a couple of years prior to that. Um, so I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. And uh, she she made that offer, so it made a lot of sense, and I was able to do um, do my MBA at the same time at Dow, so that that aligned really well. Um, and I think there's a lot of of application of of that degree in coaching, um, so it was definitely a worthwhile um, degree to do while getting into the coaching field. But um, the biggest thing for me, I I still don't know what I want to do. <laughs> um, you know, you, I say that jokingly, but you know, it's hard to believe that that this is a career because I've really just been able to follow what I love doing. And I think that would be the advice is figure out what motivates you and drives you and inspires you and, or challenges you, um, you know, maybe brings out the compete in you, like, like Hannah said, and, um, you know, and follow that path. And I think if you find things that, that match your interests and your passion that um, you're not going to feel like you're working very much and you're going to, you're going to find a path um, if you can connect with those things. Awesome. Maddie, I know yours is a bit different. Um, I think that's something that maybe athletes don't prepare for is um, sport stopping when you didn't have that planned. Um, you know, when, when an injury or like you said, when your body can't do it anymore, I think that's very different than, um, anyone who, who plays and, and manages to get through all five years without an injury that prevents them from playing, they've, they've kind of put it in their head of, you know, I start in my first year and I finish in my fifth year and I have a degree and I'm, and I'm done. So um, I guess maybe what advice do you have for any athlete that 
might end up going through one of those injuries or has gone through an injury that has stopped them from, from continuing on as the athlete that they always thought that they would be? Yeah, I, obviously it was, it was a little bit sudden. I think obviously when the injury happened, I was in my last year of high school. So it was very you know, traumatic, of course, you know, you think your whole career is going to be done. And then my first year at Acadia, it was the rehab process was just, it didn't go well. And there was just barrier after barrier. And I think I started to realize then, so I did have some time, it was hard to accept it, but I did have some time to kind of think, you know, this might be it. I might not be able to come back from this. And then fortunately growing up, my parents both, you know, extremely supportive, both athletes themselves. My brothers played a bunch of sports, so they, but they always hammered home. It was a very morbid message, but what happens if you get injured? So Mm -hmm. focus on school, focus on school. So I still had that. I still had my academic scholarship. So I was okay. Um, for me, I, this might not be the same for other people, but I really needed to take time away. So I, I wouldn't even go in my second year at Acadia. I wouldn't even go to games. It was too hard. I had to, I just stayed away from basketball. And then that summer, there was just something missing. And then I felt that I was ready at that point to come back to it. And I had, I had a passion for it. It's like, oh, I, I can connect with people through this love and this knowledge that I have of basketball. And I continued to grow on that. I think the hardest part was the loss of an identity. And I think anyone, anyone can, any of you probably feel that way too. It's when you do something your whole life and everything's surrounded by sports, you, you go to practice, everything's built around that. And then you don't have that anymore. You kind of have to figure out who you are apart from it. And coming into university, I didn't have the support system I did in high school. So it was kind of one of those times where I had to figure a lot of stuff out at once and it was really difficult, but I think that time away was really helpful in identifying kind of what my purpose was. So, you know, it's a a long winded answer to that, but I think really just taking time to reflect on who you are and what, what the sport really means to you. And for me, it was, it was more than just playing like basketball was my whole life. Mm -hmm. I'm encompassed by it. So I was able to find something and I'm a much better coach than I ever was player. So, you know, I can find solace in that. So it's good. (laughs) Yeah. Lou, I see you doing a lot of this. A oh, lot of yeah. Things. All wheels of are, it. Wheels are turning. Oh, yeah. I mean, if you want me to sum it up in one word, it was devastating when it ended as an athlete. I mean, I think what I've learned, especially in this role, is that we are very narrow-minded in terms of what we think about when we think about our involvement in sport. And we, mm-hmm. we all experience that. And it's important for us to understand the broad range of ways we can be involved. I mean, we have a finance guy who loves basketball and he's in our organization. He's just as invested. He was never a great player, never played at the post-secondary level, but I mean, there's so many different ways. And I think we, we think athlete and then we think coaching, but then for me, like I just tried to find a way to stay on the floor. And that for me was officiating. I believe I was out there being the one making the decisions and people were yelling at me because I yelled at people my entire life. (laughs) But it was a way for me to still run up and down and be involved. I think through that whole re-figuring out who I was outside, I mean, my God, I think we could be on here for an hour. Because once I stopped playing as an athlete, I started literally trying to figure out who I was in in these other areas of self-identity mm. and it's hard because like you know we're taught we want to be this and that and you know there's standards for being involved in teams and being an athlete and what that means so it's like how do you balance figuring out who you are while being totally invested in that mm. it's difficult it's really difficult not to get defined by that identity. Hmm. Yeah, I think you touched on a, a really good point there about involvement in in your sport. Um, I agree with you. I think we go athlete, coach, and then we forget, you know, manager, uh, therapist, uh, parent, yeah. mental performance. You know, official, official. Please, please, somebody who's played the game, please come make <laughs> these calls. No. <laughs> Somebody who got caught in grade 10. We don't want them out there. I'm so afraid. <laughs> I feel like you probably give people a lot of technicals. Not at all. 
and shocking. Because I'm just as passionate and I care and I understand Carly yelling why she's yelling. So, <laughs> oh yeah, you're right. You're right. <laughs> it's emotional. I I officiated one year. It was traumatizing. Yeah, it's hard. Junior mini. Yeah. <laughs> All right, here's a, a question coming in from our attendees. Uh, being a female, what challenges did you challenges did you face during your coaching pathway? Um, and obviously, Hannah, we can change that even to kind of your your pathway to being a professional basketball player. I think a lot of times we talk about um, professional being like the NBA. And I think that's where our headspace goes. And then we go to WNBA. And I, I think we lose sight of the fact that there are opportunities for women to continue their sport uh, professionally overseas. So um, I'll want me to start with you. Sure thing. Sure right. thing. Um, I just, I feel like you kind of need to filter it out as best as you can. It's there. Um, and it will be there, but like playing professionally, most people go to the guys games over the women's games typically. Um, but that's like an external thing that you, you know, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter as much because you're doing what you love to do. So, uh, I think kind of, and I feel like I'm going to say this a lot, filtering out the things that could impede on your success. Um, and focusing on why you're doing what you're doing and ultimately finding love in what you're doing is a big piece. And yeah, of course there are barriers. There are tons of barriers in playing sport and doing anything that you love to do. But at the end of the day, like you said, Carly mentioned it, she's doing what she loves to do and she doesn't feel like, uh, you know, it's a job per se because she wouldn't be anywhere else. And that's kind of how you have to treat it. So at the end of the day, there's always going to be something you just have to decide whether or not you want it to affect you positively or negatively. Mm. Yeah, I think, um, I just lost my train of thought. You'd mentioned Carly and there was something that I, I stuck in my head. Continue on. I'm going to read the question again. Okay. We'll go on to the next person. That's going to bother me. So I don't like to lose my train of thought anyways. Um, so Carly, I'll, I'll send it over to you. Um, oh, I know what it is. Carly, you just said earlier that you grew up watching um, uh, or seeing, I guess, a lot of female head coaches in the AUS, which, like you mentioned, to you, seeing that was the norm. Um, obviously, that's, that's changed, and, and um, not that it, it impacts anything in a certain type of way, but I'm sure there was an element of, of you seeing that that was like, oh, you know, I can have that coaching position. I can pursue that. So I'm curious to know what your thoughts are. Um, if the challenges that were put in place or that are in place being a female coach, if you think that those may be different for you having grown up and, and seen a bunch of female coaches as head coaches compared to maybe some of our, our current coaches or our current athletes that might not see that as, as often. I'm, I'm just wondering if the challenges would be different for you compared to someone else who might not have seen that as often growing up. You know what? I'm not, I'm not sure that they would be because I like the, the main thing that's sticking in my mind as a, as a challenge is um, having the confidence to, to, to try, I think in like a, a very, I'll say male dominated, dominated profession to, um, to insert yourself in there, to be like, be part of the conversation, um, you know, to even socialize in, in some of the networks can be a little bit intimidating when you're a young female trying to break into, um, you know, a, a coaching career. Uh, some people I've been super fortunate just to have like doors opened for me everywhere and surrounded by great people, men and women. Um, that have helped me progress. But I think even the confidence to go out there and apply for jobs and, you know, not get hired and apply again and ask for things and not get them. Um, you know, I think, I think the research says that, that women in any career don't typically apply if they don't see themselves as checking all the criteria on an, on an application, whereas men see themselves checking one or two boxes and they figure they can do it. Um, and that's not a criticism of either. It's just what the research says. So I think, 
you know, overcoming the, um, that and, and having the confidence to go out there and try is probably the biggest challenge. I think there's people there to support you through the process. And, um, there was for my journey and I think they're there for people now. Um, and, and I guess the other thing somewhat related, not entirely related, but, um, you know, as we're getting in, we're competitive people in, in this landscape, uh, there, it's very easy to be critical of other women that are pursuing the same thing that you're pursuing because you want the same thing. And I think that's one of our biggest flaws is that we're, we're critical of each other in order to try and achieve our own, um, goals and, and dreams rather than boosting each other up through the process. So um, I think that's a really, really important thing to keep in mind. It's a little bit of a, a natural characteristic of women to, to compete that way, especially in, in, uh, in a competitive environment. But I think the more that we can support each other on the journeys, even if we're competing along a similar one, I think it's an important step. Do you think that um, having that competitiveness against one another is also maybe a driving factor in us pursuing opportunities. Like there's someone kind of motivating you to, to apply for that position and, and um, kind of what are your thoughts around if you didn't have someone chasing you or challenging you in a positive light, um, where do you think you would be or, or what do you think that would look like if there wasn't somebody that was kind of motivating you in that sense? I think I would compare that similar to being um, a player in that, everyone's a little bit different in what motivates them and pushes them, you know, and that's what I take into coaching and that not every player is going to respond to the same um, motivational tactics, I guess, or, or ways of coaching. Um, so I think like there's certainly some positives for a lot of people um, with that, with that in mind, um, but would just say we can have that friendly competition without, um, essentially like putting each other down which doesn't happen publicly but I think you know you I'm sure all of us have done at some point um there's actually the story of of Nova Scotia lobster if if anybody knows it um it, this is a story from my high school coach Stephen Stewart who's one of the best coaches okay. I've ever played for mm -hmm. um, he told our team one year about the story of the Nova Scotia lobster and the story is that you know, you put them in the pot, it's lobster season right now, they all go into boiling water and one of like, one of them starts to get close to the edge to pull its way out. And the one that's stuck in the water pulls that guy back down. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, you know, that's kind of the similar perspective of that I'm trying to give of women in coaching. You know, if someone's on the edge if that lobster's on the edge and almost out of the pot and not going to have be eaten for dinner that night, like, can you boost them up rather than then pull them back down type thing. I like that. I never gave never you that, gave one that one for him. You usually have a special one for every team every season, I think. So. I like that. That's good. Yeah. Lou or Maddie, what are your thoughts there? Challenges on your... What's the question again? <laughs> Come on now. I'm just kidding. Um, being a female, what challenges did you face during your coaching pathway? Or oh. Lou, we can even give you maybe officiating as well, I oh. think. <laughs> Like, I mean, I, I, I gave a presentation at Brock and I was involved in this gender equity network. And I mean, the foundation of it is men and women experience the world very differently. The expectations for what it means to be female and what it be, means to be male define, those are one of, that's one of the external labels that we're told, this is what you gotta be. This is what you gotta be. You know, so yeah, absolutely. When it comes to sport, which requires you to be aggressive and confident, and it doesn't necessarily align with these ways that we are socialized as women and females. I mean, just as everyone said here, the, the toughest part of that is overcoming that and saying, no, I want to be competitive and aggressive and you know, I want to be involved in this, and, and it goes counter to how we're being socialized. I can't tell you the number of times I was put in a dress under the age of 10. That's not conducive to <laughs> sporting. <laughs> Kudos to those women in the bloomers back in the 1900s. 
Um, so yeah, I don't know what the question is. They but blazed a trail for us. Come on now. Well, well, yeah, they absolutely did. But I mean, it doesn't, it's 2020 and absolutely we're still in these rooms full of men trying to network and socialize and speak like them and be a part of that. So, and I mean, in the officiating, I don't even want to say this, but it's, it's somewhat even worse. The, the norms that are associated in these sporting cultures are not very welcoming for women, especially young women. So I can see why there's only one in 10 when you're getting into those environments. It's not great. And that's one of the challenges when we're starting to recruit young women. It's like, how do you recruit them into this, this culture? Yeah. We need to change that. Some of the behaviors that we're accepting in these sporting environments are so unacceptable in other areas of our lives. It's not even funny. Mm -hmm. So yeah, challenges, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Maddie, what are your thoughts? I think, I mean, they're all, they're all really excellent points. And I think there's a, there's a distinction between the challenges and then the barriers because there's a lot of barriers that I think that we put on ourselves. Like Carly said, I know myself, if I look through an, a job application, I'm like, Oh, well, I don't have this. I don't have this. I'm probably not going to put myself out there. Um, I mean, when I was first starting, especially, I think I've kind of gotten to a point now where I'm just trying to operate like a white man in the world, just like go get it and try what's the worst that's going to happen. You're not going to get it. But when I was coaching, I coached boys for a little bit in, uh, in the Annapolis Valley. And we had, we were, I was co-head coaches with a, a good buddy of mine and we had a male manager and there was one day he, the male coach couldn't be there. And so the entire game, the ref is coming to talk to the, to the male manager the entire time. He's like, I don't know, buddy, I don't know what's going on. So it's just, just simple things like that. When you're the only woman in the, in the gym, it, it can get a little frustrating and, you know, being called sweetie and honey when you know, by these old men that you just don't know. It's uh, yeah. it can be uncomfortable. But, you know, in the grand scheme of things, when I was doing my research, it, there are, we know there's not a lot of women in men's basketball. And there are, you know, people that are blazing trails. Like you look at Chantal, Wumi, um, Tamara, who are getting their feet in the door there. But like Carly said, sometimes I think we tend to sabotage other women because we only have access to about 25% of the jobs when you really think about it. We only get the women's jobs. And even then, we're not even covering half of those. So I think I strongly feel that we, we have a responsibility to help women get, have an opportunity. And I wouldn't have any of the jobs that I ever had without the female mentors and role models I had. So I think it's, it's my social responsibility and one of the reasons why I definitely coach is to help bridge that gap and give the opportunity to young women that maybe they wouldn't have had if they didn't have someone looking out for them. That's how I feel about it. That's Lovely. A, a great segue into a question I didn't ask last week, but I'm excited for this answer, for all the answers. Um, mentorship. Um, I know, Maddie, that's one of the things you just ended on there. Mm -hmm. um, who would you say were your mentors if you had multiple? And then I think on the other side, um, do you feel like you are a mentor and what does that look like? I know when you, you said there, Maddie, that you feel like it's a, your social responsibility. Um, and I definitely agree with you there. I think, you know, people blaze trails for all of us to be where we are and, and hopefully we're doing the same thing for those that are coming behind us. So um, yeah, mentors, who were your mentors? And then who are you, well, you don't need to say who you're mentoring. That's the final sentence there. Um, but what does that role look like when you're, when you're providing that mentorship piece to someone behind you? I guess I can jump off since I ended there. Um, my role models were, I, I had a lot of good male coaches, don't get me wrong, but my, my most influential coaches were definitely my female coaches. So U15, I had Joyce Slip, who, I mean, I think, most people know Joyce, like she blazed mm -hmm. trails in two sports at a higher level. And she was my first provincial coach. She was the first person that ever told me that I could play at the next level or that I could actually coach at the next level. So she's, she was the one that encouraged me when I went to UBC to go talk to Deb. It took me two weeks to do it, but I still did it. Um, I, 
eventually got in the door. And then um, I had another coach, another provincial coach, who her name's Liz, and she, Liz Doyle, I don't know if you'd know her. She hasn't coached Basel New Brunswick for a little bit. Lou, you know her? Yeah. yeah. She's the best. So, and again, she, she was a huge mentor to me, and we're still, we still talk often, and someone I really leaned on when I was getting into coaching. Um, so they, they've had the most impact on me. Um, and it's not even the basketball that obviously they were great coaches, but it was the, the time they took to have a personal relationship and get to know me mm-hmm. and really push me to that next, that next level. And now since I'm, I'm running CP now, I have recruited like three female coaches this year to come on board to try and just, you know, give them a higher level experience and really give them an opportunity to coach, um, with Ontario basketball and, give them the reins so it was nice for me I didn't have to plan everything but mm-hmm. um but that's just one of the things in trying to debrief and really get them thinking it's still a work in progress it's the first time I've really tried to do that but you know it's got to start somewhere so awesome any other thoughts from anyone else yeah I, you know similar perspective I've talked about a few women that um I was able to be surrounded by, by as coaches. Um, but I, I, I think it's important to state that there's a lot of incredible men coaches out there that are creating pathways for all of us as well. Um, mm-hmm. You know, obviously Mike McKay had um, a massive impact on Nova Scotia basketball, Canada basketball, and has helped you know, me move through the pathway at every level with, uh, with national team in particular. Um, you know, he's encouraged, challenged, um, everything in between for, for me. So he's been a pivotal part. I talked about Steven Stewart, my high school coach. Um, you know, he's still following what I'm doing. He's the, he's the one that helped me when I got my first head coaching position. And I was like, what the heck am I doing? I have no idea. Um, you know, he was the first person who I spent time with to, to figure that out. Um, you know, Fabian McKenzie, we were both assistant coaches with provincial team one year and, to this day, he will chat, you know, boost your confidence, um, you know, talk basketball with you. Um, and, and he's a junkie. And I think there's, you know, so many people in, in the Nova Scotia community that, that have helped, you know, inspire and, and push me along. And, um, and then I've been fortunate to, to connect with some incredible women too, like Allison McNeil, who's our former national team head coach, um, who would have a conversation with anybody. I think if you reached out, she's one of the best at, at mentoring and um, encouraging women in the pathway. So is Shawnee Hurley, mm-hmm. uh, Bev Smith, Lisa Tomitis. Like there's some incredibly successful women at the highest level out there uh, helping moving, helping to move women coaches along. Yeah, I think uh, not to, to jump in here on, on your panel discussion, but I think Carly, you touched on a really critical piece there in, in mentioning that you know, women aren't the only people blazing trails. Um, it can be very clearly your male coaches, your brothers, your fathers. Um, and I think uh, a lot of times it's a it's a group effort to move things forward. It can't just come from um, one perspective or else uh, we'd be stuck in a situation where everything would be the same. So um, I just want to acknowledge that. I appreciate that you did bring that up. And, and Steve Stewart was a delight uh, as, as a coach for one year that I had him. So yeah, he, he's great and was one of the best. So just thanks for acknowledging that. Hannah, Hannah, what do you got? Honestly, there are too many people that have helped me along the way. Yeah. Best advice in this scenario is just hitch your wagon to somebody who can influence and make you better, uh, and keep you moving forward. Um, there are several coaches that have helped develop me along the way, several players, going to camps and playing with people that are better than you is huge. It's a huge piece. It it just, it makes you see a new standard and it makes you want to follow that standard. You have things to compare to and things that you, you know, you can improve upon. So find whatever really works, honestly, anything, the last dance documentary right now, we're all sitting at home. Like it's hard not to get goosebumps when you're watching that (laughs) documentary. Like, it's phenomenal. It's whatever you can really find. And there are so many people that have helped me along the way. I couldn't just say one. Mm. Fair enough. Same with me. Yeah. 
definitely the names of the coaches mentioned, Mike McKay, I would never have even been as good as I was without his mentorship and belief in me from age six, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and continues throughout now that he works at Canada Basketball. And like Carly said, the, the building and the challenging, that's the best part of it all is like uh, just the challenging you to think and be better and reflect. A Joyce as well at my time at UMB. I mean, again, I think you hit on it, Madeline, that it was about more about the time she took about the relationship that was built. Mm -hmm. You know, that was way more impactful for me at, with my time at UMB than anything to do with putting a ball in a hoop. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so many people. I mean, I call my mom every day. She's been. Is she listening? Did she join? I forgot to check. Oh, I have no idea. You saw me with the volume. I don't. That was bad. Here. <laughs> <laughs> so bad. All right. Um, uh, I've got a couple questions coming in from the the group here. So I'm interested with for this one. Um, with so many top Canadian basketball players looking for a full ride to the USA, what are the benefits for them to stay in Canada and what can we do to change things to keep them here? Well, I think it's these degrees I bought online. <laughs> <laughs> this is the value. The Canadian education and the network here. Uh, <laughs> I, I mean, yeah. So... Even even when we were graduating way back in the 2000s, this whole draw to the United States for free education was there. I mean, it's even crazier now. People are willing to go out, sit down in southern Texas on the end of a Division II bench for a free, for what? And then a, a, no Canadian education, no opportunities like Carly talked about with networking in the basketball community. I'd love to hear Anna, Hannah's uh, answer to this question too. Mm. Uh, well, like you said, Lou, networking is a huge piece and you guys like, I feel like we've all benefited in some way from networking and getting to know people. Um, there definitely is a pull just because, um, you know, it's just so highly sold that, you know, the way forward is go to the NCAA and represent. But I'm the true believer that you need to follow where you feel the most pride and to me, that was like playing within Canada. That was playing at uh, Cape Breton Island where I was born and raised. Like you can do it here. There are resources. There's people like you that can help you move forward. And while there are a ton of resources to go and do that, there are, in my opinion, just as much to stay here and, you know, be local and get to know people within the community because like I said, I don't know many people who can fully let the sport go. You, you want to be involved in some way and to have created an identity for yourself within a community and to be able to tell your story like you can right now and, you know, make an impact is to me the most important thing that you can do for sport. So for me, that would be staying within Canada and, you know, following through within the system and proving that the system works. Hmm. I would say a couple key things are, um, in general, I think we all need to be a little less Canadian. And what I mean mm -hmm. by that is less uh, humble and quiet and tell the story of what U sports basketball is, because I think it's tremendous, but we need to put it out there. We need to market it. We need to get it like, in on screens and 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 uh continue to, to market our product in local communities so there's uh you know a, a pride like hannah spoke to associated with that i think there's a you know a perception of a, achieving a scholarship to the ncaa um that like that is the goal um, you know, and, and that's even becoming the highlight, I think, with some recruits is the commitment as opposed to the actual experience once they go to where they commit. Um, when they transfer back after the first year. <laughs> <laughs> I did it! I committed! <laughs> um, so I think the more that we can share the story of the experience here, there's, um, you know, there's opportunities to win. Uh, you can go to... Uh, 
any conference in the NCAA and, um, you know, you might never even compete for a conference championship, let alone a national championship. Now, there, there's some Canadians at our national team level that should be going to the NCAA right now because the top 25 teams are way better than our top teams in Canada right now. The athleticism is another level. Um, but our best Canadian teams are equivalent to teams that are playing in the NCAA tournament, and we need to continue to tell those stories too. Um, we're going down there, we're playing them, we're beating them. I think we play a more exciting style of game with the FIBA rules. Um, but again, I think we, and we need to tell these stories. Um, and there, there's some great experiences down there, but there's also some, some not a great experiences here and, and the education and the network and the opportunities within basketball, but outside of basketball as well, um, can really set you up, up well for your future. That's a great point, Carly. It's hard to add on to that because um, not all D1 or not all NCAA schools are created equal. I think we can say that the majority of Canadian schools were pretty on par in terms of our academics and what is given. You get a degree, you know, on the East Coast, you're just as qualified as someone on the West Coast or in Ontario, but you go down to the States and there's, there can be things missing when you come back and then you don't have those connections. And then that's when I'm recruiting kids that are kind of on the edge, it's, I try and really push home, I support you whatever way you go, but what happens if you get injured? You know, talk, talk to the people at the end of the bench, talk to the academic advisors, because if you get injured, are you going to be just as supported as you would be here in Canada? Uh, are you going to be cast aside because they can get, you know, more recruits that are just like you um, down the road? How much is their investment tied to your performance? That kind of stuff, because it's not created equal. But I think Carly hit it on the head. Canadian basketball is fantastic, and we just need to keep promoting and keep believing in our product. I think it, it goes back to what Hannah said early on, too, about understanding who you are and what you value, because for a lot of what I hear, it's not even the athlete's dream. It's the parent's dream. Mm -hmm. And so it's important for you as an athlete to start to figure out what, what is it that you want, when, what kind of experience do you want in that four years? Mm. Yeah, and uh, I'll just add in thinking about making that decision and, and recognizing the people that are in your corner to support you when you are making that decision, because there's a lot of outside influences. And I think, you know, you really have to navigate that with the people that are closest to you that want what's best for you and, and know ultimately where you really want to go. And, and those are hard decisions. And, and uh, I feel for anyone that's going through that process right now, because you're, you're trying to make the best decision, but there's so many options out there. But I, I think to Hannah's point is absolutely, you know, do the, pick the one that's best for you because, you know, Maddie said all the schools are created equally in Canada in terms of when you get an education, it'll, it'll apply across the country. But at the same time, you yourself won't fit into each school. Are you looking for a, a big school? Are you looking for a small one, a smaller campus? You know, what does the atmosphere look like in the gym? And I think that, that, you know, we're always needing to keep that in mind. Um, when we even try to help nav help athletes navigate that process is the decision is ultimately yours and and it has to be where you feel you fit in the best that's not easy uh next question here what is the most important thing that you've learned along the way about yourself so many things I learned so many things about myself. It's like, as much as you uh, benefit and grow through playing, like playing basketball and the technical side of it, I just feel like the personal growth that I've experienced through sport exceeds anything else that I could have accomplished. Um, when you look at that, I would say, if you're gonna be an athlete, you really need to be self-aware and you're kind of forced into that because when you're playing at an elite level, you have to begin to understand how your brain works. And the mental game is a huge piece to your overall success as an athlete. So 
I'm a person that's kind of, I would say that I'm kind of addicted to getting something right. And when I don't get something right, it plays a toll and has an effect on uh, myself and my ability to move forward. So I've had to learn over the years and I'm still working on it. I wouldn't even say that I'm that good at it is to kind of take my emotions out of things and see it for what it is. And yeah, I would say that developing a self-awareness toward yourself so that you can perform at a high level and to be able to function within a team is something that I would say I've learned through sport. I like that. Lou, are you writing stuff down? Yeah. I don't, one thing I've learned about myself is I'm all over the place and that I need structure <laughs> and I need to write it down. And that's still, I still go squirrel. Um, <laughs> oh my gosh, everything. I mean, I'm still learning about myself. I mean, if I think about exactly what I just said in terms of what basketball did for me, it gave me a objective for and a structure. And that's why I stayed in school. And that's why I did what I did. Um, and without that, I'm not a very productive person. And therefore, I need to continue to have those routines and those structures. Um, so much about myself. I can't even begin to, I mean, I'd have to write a book. <laughs> I'm looking forward to buying it. Okay. I need an editor. I don't know how to use punctuation. <laughs> One run-on sentence, 100 pages worth. <laughs> I like challenge. I know that. Mm. I need challenge. Did you always need challenge? Yeah. I'm bored without something to challenge me. I always want, like, you know, Hannah said she's addicted to getting it right. Well, I don't necessarily think it's right or wrong. I just always wonder how I can make it better, be better, grow there. I mean, the different areas of the athlete that we talk about, I'm looking at those for myself all the time. My social, emotional growth. Hmm. I'm always learning. Excellent. Maddie or Carly, what do you got? Um, again, I mean, constantly learning something new. Sometimes it's pleasant, sometimes it's not. But the biggest thing is that I've learned it's, it's okay to be wrong sometimes and it's okay not to know the answer. And, you know, I think I spent a lot of time being scared of making mistakes and kind of looking like I didn't know what was going on, but it's really important to ask questions. Um, especially when I think about my athletes, you know, it's, it's okay for them to know that I don't know the answer, but I'm going to find it for them because they need it instead of me trying to make something up. So I had to save face and that, that took a while for me to get comfortable with that. But now I'm in a place where I'm like, okay, I don't know the answer, but I can get better at this and that's okay. And I think that's really important. Um, yeah. So just being okay with where you're at. Yeah, I, I, I think that's a, you know, thinking back that's to- tough. That's a really tough one, but it's like so important. Oh, Hannah froze. She'll be back. There she Did is. Did I freeze? Yeah. Just you guys second. froze, so I, I didn't think it was me. I thought it was you. <laughs> just you. Um, Carly, what do you, what do you think? Um, it's really hard to pick one thing. Hmm. I feel like I learn something every day. It's part of the reason I, I love it. And, um, but I would, I would say I'm, I'm my own biggest critic in everything. And I, I have, I think, a, a level of self-awareness to a fault um, mm -hmm. as, as it re relates to my own self-criticism. Um, um, so I think probably what I have learned is confidence and, and, and how to have some and, and hopefully exude some, some moments. Um, that has had to be practiced for me because of the, the level of criticism and, and self-awareness that I, that I have under everything that I'm doing. So uh, mm -hmm. I guess it'd be that. Do any of you feel like your 
time as an athlete helped prepare you for the position that you're in right now? Again, Hannah, I know, I know you're still playing, but even your time um, maybe playing for Canada and now playing professionally. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, so I missed part of the question. Are you, were you saying that? Um, what, what uh, saying? is there anything that you learned from your time playing for Canada that um, I think prepared you for your time as a professional athlete? Yeah, yeah, yep, absolutely. Just playing at the international level. I've never done that before, for one. Uh, for two, I was kind of um, moved into a role where I could transition between a four and a five, which is something that I never really had to do as much. Um, so that was a really great opportunity. I worked amongst like some really talented players and really talented coaches that kind of helped me along the way. I wish I had more time with them, but that was for me something, um, just developing a little bit at that level made me realize that, okay, this is, this is the way forward for for me, if I want to continue on with my career, I need to become a little bit, I need to add more things to my game. I need to go back to the drawing board and work on different skill sets and stuff. So I think adapting, adapting to a different environment and realizing and recognizing that there are things to be improved upon in order to, you know, make that transition mm. is a huge, is really important and kind of embracing the change is something that the sooner you do it the better <laughs> embracing the change i'm gonna go completely off topic here and send it right over to my yes. good friend carly no lou not you yeah carly we're going oh. into all right carly here's what we got off embracing... topic is me <laughs> <laughs> embracing the change how is our senior women senior women's national team embracing the change with the olympics being completely moved um which would impact i'm sure their their physical training their mental training and and how does that i guess how are you preparing them for hopefully next year yeah great question i think um you know first off everyone's impacted differently with with the move we've got um players that are nearing the end of their career and this will be or would be their last Olympics or maybe last stint with our national team and now being pushed back a year that that's going to change things for them. Um, and then we've got athletes that are banged up and injured and, and dealing with some different things where, you know, this extra year might be a blessing in terms of um, their health and readiness for, mm -hmm. for the Olympics. So from that perspective, there's, there's lots of different things. Um, you know, in a lot of ways, the women on our senior national team are fairly well prepared for this because so many of them have played professionally overseas for five, 10, 15 years, um, where the isolation life that we're living is, you know, somewhat of the norm at times in some of the professional settings when you're in um, Asia or Russia or, you know, a lot of our women now are in, are in France as an example, which is a great place to be, but there's still you're by yourself in a new environment with a different language. Um, so there's, you know, some of these things are, are the norm, but um, so they're well prepared, but we are just trying to, to stay connected, stay fit. And, and as if everything right now, everything is an unknown. We don't know what's next um, other than the targeted date for the Olympics. So um, just trying to focus on each day and again, stay connected and, and find little things to make improvements through this time. With connection, there's a, a question that just came in with how are each of you staying connected with your athletes? And Hannah, maybe how are you staying connected with your teammates and, and your coach as well? Um, for me, there's a lot of Zoom. Zoom is this, it's where everybody is, I feel. Everyone's always logged into this at all times. So um, are there any other ways that each of you are staying connected with your athletes? That's certainly the big one for us. Um, serves as a great face-to-face -face and get everybody in the same place. Um, mm -hmm. So that's that's been a great thing. I think there's some different individual conversations and check-ins going in and 
you know, maybe fitness challenges. Um, but it, it is an interesting time because everybody's in a different space mentally. Um, you know, I talked about our national team players being fairly comfortable, a lot of them in, in this situation. Um, <clears throat> not that it's exactly this, but for some people it's completely new and different and, and mentally they're, they're impacted and training isn't something that, that really fits with where they are. So, um, you know, trying to work through some of those different challenges have been, uh, have been important for us anyway. Yeah, Zoom, Zoom's the best. I mean, we, we meet twice a week. One is a check-in, one is more of a, you know, a lesson on how, how to grow, different challenges, uh, personal challenges. They have their own groups too. We split them off. So they have responsibilities and leadership groups. I think the, the hardest one, and I'm sure, Carly, you probably have this too, is the athletes that require physio, that require stuff like that that's been one of the harder things where they they have really little access to them other than commun communicating with the therapist themselves but they can't get any treatment so mm. it's that's a tough one and the the break is obviously good for their bodies but it's also we don't know what we're going to get when we're allowed to get back in the gym are they going to be ready to go full tilt again um so that's been hard and then you add in the mental piece. The mental piece is the is the hardest part for sure. So we try and stay connected as much as we can and encourage them to connect independently as well. Well, um, oh, sorry, go ahead. All right, no, go ahead, Lou. What do you got for us? Go ahead, Hannah. <laughs> I jumped in, I didn't realize I was jumping in. Um, yeah, staying connected is, um, definitely, definitely tricky. And I, I kind of smile, Carly, when you mentioned that the people who play overseas kind of are a little bit more uh, used to the isolation piece just because of the language barrier and everything. And I definitely felt that, especially because it's now your job and you, you know, you're going to the gym twice a day like then you have the rest time so you have a lot of uh, time by yourself absolutely so i'm just saying that because the transition for me into this isolation i was like i've been isolating all year we're good <laughs> <laughs> but but yeah i think it's really important especially now to connect with your teammates for sure and i think it's great that you guys are having zoom conversations because you really do look forward to it staying connected to a team and when you're part of one, you, you miss the social aspect when you're not around it as much. Also, it's important um, to make sure that you have an accountability partner, somebody that you know, you're know you asking, like the hardest working person on the team, what are you doing every single day? Mm -hmm. And use it as like competitive fuel for yourself to be like, okay, well, I need to do like a little bit more than this person. I need to make sure that I'm doing this. And you kind of get to bounce off and feed off of each other throughout uh, the summer and through the time of unsureness. Also, you kind of miss the resources that you have a little bit. Um, just having like your strength and conditioning coach and having an air conditioned gym, like just being able to do that is huge. Like I'm back down to my roots at the courts. I got a beautiful sunburn just cause I'm not used to like playing outside and stuff as much. So you kind of just got to roll with it as best as you can and to deal with the isolation and try to find ways that you can navigate it. Here's a question. Um, who, and Hannah, maybe not so much for you because you're kind of in the athlete area. Um, Carly, Maddie, and Lou, how do you stay mentally focused? I think a lot of times for us as coaches and as leaders, it's kind of our job to provide support to others. How do each of you seek support for yourself so that you're not always giving of yourself at all times, especially right now? I call my mom every day. <laughs> Is she I on the call? call? <laughs> Yes. No, she's not. Oh. Um, you know, I mean, I was trying to relate to that last question, and I think it, the original one was 
uh, like how it translate into your current role. Yeah. Um, I, my team and my staff at work, I think of them as my teammates. We talk about our mission, vision, and values, roles. Um, yeah, I mean, we've experienced quite a bit of change in the last little while because of COVID. We had all of our provincial championships canceled and that resulted in some temporary layoffs. So it has been difficult on the side of not being connected with those teammates as they're as they're laid off. So um it's it's hard. I mean I've tried to stay task oriented knowing that they'll be back eventually mm -hmm. and that we're back on the rails with basketball. So I think I've just I have my own short like our basketball development plan is now Lou keep it above water until everyone's back. So <laughs> I think I'm staying in sort of task oriented right now just waiting for them to get back when we get back on the rails. So mm. it's not easy though. <laughs> it's hard. Yeah, that's a big change. It's a big change. Yeah. For me with that, I think there's a couple things. I won't relate it all to, to the COVID situation, but um, I certainly have my group of people that I'll reach out to after a tough game or, you know, something doesn't go the way you want it to go. Um, just to, either vent about it or to throw ideas around how to deal with it. Um, so I've got set like three or four people that I would consider my people for those types of things in addition to our coaching staff. Um, and they're critical and they're critical of me. And so, you know, it goes back to the, the mentors, but they, some of them are different from the people that I mentioned. Um, in terms of performance in the coaching job, um, those people are still there all season. Um, but I remember as a player uh, doing some mental training sessions and, and talking about routine and funnel. And as a coach, I for sure have a routine to get in my funnel. And so I'm in the right headspace for the start of a game and even the start of a practice to make sure I show up the best version of myself. Um, you know, I have, have triggers. I become hyper aware of what they are. I yell at Lou a lot when she used to referee our games. Uh, she doesn't do anymore. So, um, and I go, what? What did you say? I didn't hear you. It was loud enough. And then I yell more. Uh, no, but like I, I'm very aware that uh, that referees are one of the things that cause me to lose emotional control. Probably like one of the very few things. So I've worked very hard over the past few years to, to better manage my emotions, um, both in response to calls that I don't like and to, um, to get myself back on track. I think there's lots of mental skills that athletes use that I use as a coach. Mm -hmm. I apply them in my everyday life. <laughs> Same. Have to. Yeah. Um, I got, uh, oh. This one's specifically Triggered. for you, Lou. What, uh -oh. do you, what do you think is the biggest reason why Windsor Essex County doesn't have an OSBA team? Well, are you sure that's not for Maddie? <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> I don't know. I have no idea. What is the biggest? Because uh, I got to <laughs> think about that. What's the biggest reason? Um. Come back to me on that. Come back to you. All right, we're gonna go. I got two more questions that I, I definitely want to ask. Um, I think Lou, I'm, I'm going back to you because you already mentioned it at the beginning of this call. Um, failures. I feel like you had something that oh, you wanted yeah. to speak about. Well, I looked up the definition of a failure for one. Do you have it right there? Yeah, I did have it. It was failure to follow the basic rules. That's me every day. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I mean, I laugh at, so for example, that bio you asked me to send along, I laugh when I send those bios along. Because <laughs> it highlights like all these areas where I finally had the success. It doesn't outline the failures leading up to those successes. Like, mm. 
I mean, there's so many. I think about, for example, my time at the University of Alberta. I had a great first year. I was Canada West Rookie of the Year, and we lost in the national final. And two weeks later, I got a letter saying, uh, yeah, you're academics. You're, you're on probation. You're, you're kicked out. And I think for me, that was sort of a wake up call with respect to like, what am I doing? What am I actually here? What am I capable of handling in terms of basketball and academics? Like getting realistic about what it meant to be in university mm -hmm. across the country, what my capabilities were in the academic realm. I mean, same, I mean, it's just endless how many failures. This job, I applied for this job, somebody else got it. She turned it down, so they offered it to me. I mean. And look at you now. What's that? Look at you now. Oh yeah, look at me now. <laughs> Eight years in. <laughs> so many. Uh, I don't even think failures though. What would you call them? Learning opportunities. Personal growth and development. <laughs> so many times I've tried to go after things and the doors shut and then the journey ends up unfolding in a different way where I'm like, whoa, okay. Kind of like Carly said, like, I still don't know what I want to do. Mm -hmm. I'm, the journey sort of unfolding as I go here. And all those, le the learning opportunities are just pushing you in certain directions. I like that idea, that concept around, you know, when yeah. we're, we're looking at failure, we think it's a really negative thing and it, it hurts at the time. But like you said, it, it points you in a completely different direction that maybe you weren't even thinking of and ultimately leads you to where you are now. Very good. Absolutely. Yeah. Anyone else want to touch on failures and, and not that you need to list failures. I think we all have them, but maybe how it shaped you or, or how to put a positive spin on, on those moments. I have a kind of funny one if you're into that. Do it. Um, yeah. It's uh, so my, my first year coaching team New Brunswick went really well the, as a head coach, but the second year I thought it would just be, the same. Um, we, I had even better athletes the second year and it just was a, we went to a Montreal tournament and it culminated with the bus breaking down and they were stranded on the side of the road and they got trapped on La Ronde during a Canada Day fireworks um, celebration. And I, that was a point where I really realized, wow, I don't know what I'm doing to the point, like what I thought I knew, I didn't know anything. So I, I thought I had at least covered. It was good. We got the bus rented. We're fine. I didn't think to even check that it was had been properly inspected. I just trusted the parent that was like, I've got it. And then they're like, oh, we're going to drive the girls over. I completely forgot it was Canada Day. Didn't think about it. So all those details that I should have thought about, now I think about those things. Mm. So it's it was a big learning experience. Sometimes Chantal thinks I'm a little bit too high strung when I think about the details. But, you know, I don't want to get stuck in a situation like that again. So it was a, it was a big learning experience for me. It's funny now, but at the time it was <laughs> At the time, not so much. <laughs> yeah, but it's, uh, yeah, it was a good learning, learning opportunity, Lou, like you said. Mm. It's good. Yeah. It sucks at the time. Yeah. <laughs> we got about eight minutes left. I got one more question and then I'll let you all go for the evening. Um, if you had to put a moment of your playing or coaching career, like one clip into where I'm going to read my question word for word. If you could put one highlight from your basketball life, whether as an athlete or as a coach into the video montage of one shining moment, what would it be? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> One. The day I beat my brother in one on one. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. How old were you? Probably 12. What a great clip to put in there. That's good. That was the peak. In other words, what one thing 
kind of stands out to you as something that was just really, really important in your playing or coaching career that is something that you reflect on frequently? That's a really different question, the way you phrased it right there, but <laughs> it took me to a different place. Um, I don't reflect on this frequently, but <clears throat> I haven't touched on it on this call, but with my time at UPEI, we lost a lot of games. Uh, we didn't win a regular season game for until my third season. We were completely rebuilding. So, you know, that could fall into the failure category, depending on how you view it. Um, Similar to Lou, I don't think I, I view it as a failure because I think those moments were pivotal to get me to where I am now. Uh, but I've been since then really, really fortunate to be part of some incredible moments, championships, medals, um, seeing teams succeed. Uh, but I'll never forget where I was when we finally won our first regular season game. Mm. Uh, it was it was extra special because it was in Newfoundland at Memorial and everybody on the East coast knows how tough it is to go and win in Newfoundland. So, um, you know, yeah, that one, will, <laughs> we won't talk about what happened the next day. But the first day we, we won and they, they the were Sunday a strong game? team. That, oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you win your first ever game in three years and then you go play at 11 a.m. the next day. Right. But, uh, yeah, I guess so So winning that game because, you know, that was a pivotal moment. And a lot of those players after I left went on to have uh, really strong seasons with UPEI. So, yeah. Awesome. And I would say winning an AUS championship in my third year was uh, definitely something I'll never forget. Uh, just based on the feeling, like I, I'm a sucker for a good story. And to me, that was a good story. And I can like flash back and think about it and feel really, really good about that experience just because, um, you know, when you're with a team and you're growing and developing with a team for so long, at the end of the day, you have a goal. And when we were able to accomplish that goal and to see the look on everybody's faces and the reaction from it and to feel like you did that after all the ups and downs, but more ups, uh, it was like, it was a pretty phenomenal experience. I'll never, that, that is to me currently the, the moment, the moment. I was in the sky box for that. Great games. It, oh. <laughs> I'm from a distance. Oh. Love it. Maddie, what about you? Um, I don't know. They, they don't seem very big when I say them out loud, but I mean, this year was, was cool. Um, thank you, Carly, for not kicking our ass too much. From this <laughs> but, um, like 45 minutes before the game, Chantel, she had been in a car accident and I was kind of just thrown into it. She made the decision she tried and I so much respect her for trying to do, but she just couldn't. Mm -hmm. And she ended up sleeping like for 14 straight hours the next day. So I was, I had to just be the head coach. It was, it was very, it was very sudden. Um, but the respect that my athletes had, and we didn't play our best for sure. There was a lot of things and obviously very weird situation for everyone, but the respect of the athletes to go out there and still play hard and they didn't miss a beat between the two of us. And I, that, that was really special to me. And then the next day Chantel was on the bench, but she said, no, nope, you earned it. And I got my first win wow. the next day, which was, which was really cool. And again, it wasn't the win so much as the fact that the girls played with joy and they were pumped to be there. They had a great game. They rebounded really well. So from the night before. So again, thank you, Carly, for not making it so scary, but uh, it was, it was a good weekend. So. Wow. That's, I didn't know that. That's uh, that would be, um, I think I would certainly be overwhelmed, especially if it wasn't something that you were preparing for. So that's a really unique story. And the fact that your athletes responded to you as a coach, I think speaks volumes as your position right now as the assistant coach. And, and for anyone that is an assistant coach or, or a manager, I think even taking that time to reflect on the value that you have to the team, even though you aren't sitting in the seat as the head coach, the athletes still look up to you. So I think that's a great story to, to end on Maddie. Uh, Lou, 
no answer on the uh, Windsor Essex County OSB team debacle or what? No, can you give me that person's contact though? I'll connect yeah. with them. Perfect. <laughs> um, that's From it. Windsor Essex County? It is. I can send it to you too, Lou. 8.30, Liz will not be making an appearance. An appearance. Mom, she's somewhere listening, but she won't be making her, her cameo. Very disappointing. Um, and just thank you to all of you for taking the time um, to jump on this call and, and give your perspective on some different things. And, you know, we didn't get to every question, but I really liked the way that the conversation went. And again, I appreciate your time and the time that everyone took to to join in and listen so we'll have this up on youtube within the next day or two and uh we'll make sure to edit out anything that may have gone awry but no one swore so that's a plus <laughs> what <laughs> an hour and a half without swearing yeah exactly. that's my biggest accomplishment <laughs> uh and lots of people are saying uh saying great job and and thanks for sharing your perspective so thanks everyone um have a, a great evening. You too. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Deja. All right. Bye. See you guys.